Good morning to you all, wherever you are. My name is Richard Slater and I'm the publisher of the Lancashire Business View magazine. Welcome to National Apprenticeship Week and welcome to the Lancashire Apprenticeship Conference. The theme for this year's National Apprenticeship Week is Build the Future, Train, Retain, Achieve. It's a theme that carries even more weight as Lancashire businesses look to post-Covid recovery. And the strands, train, retain, achieve, really do capture the spirit of what apprenticeships mean and what they can give your business. So much so that we've lifted them wholesale, ladies and gentlemen, to develop the structure for today's Lancashire conference. Our guests today will carry that spirit. We have a multitude of speakers from businesses employing apprentices to the training and skills providers who add so much to our collective skills base. We'll also hear about some of the nuts and bolts of apprenticeship schemes and we'll be hearing from apprentices themselves. There are many challenges to our business, or rather our businesses. There's the pandemic, there's Brexit, there's changes to the way we work and the trading turbulence that comes with all that. But we all know the value of a motivated and skilled workforce. Our people are our business. If I've heard it once, well, I've heard it a million times and so have you. So part of our job today is to investigate the role apprenticeships can play in meeting our challenges, grabbing our opportunities by working better with our people. With three panel discussions coming this morning, with speakers eager to share their wisdom and their insight. Each panel is brief to focus on one of today's themes, and we have breakout interviews and clips as well. That's a bit of VT to roll, ladies and gentlemen. And all of this is intended to drive home those themes train, retain, achieve. Doubtless, there will be other conversation points and we welcome your questions throughout the event. Please share those through the Zoom chat and at the formal conclusion of the event, we will all decamp to the informal chaos of an all-in networking do, should you wish to stay with us for a virtual brew at the end. Now, before I introduce our first guest, it would be remiss of me not to thank those who are supporting us on this event. So please, Rattle your teacups and dunk your croissants as we show our gratitude to our friends at Blackburn College, Blackpool and the Fylde College, Burnley College, Nelson and Cole College, North Lancs Training Group, that's NLTG, Persimmon Homes, Plums, Preston College, University of Central Lancashire and Vika. So, back to our first guest. Here to help us set the scene this morning is Michelle Lorty jones Director of Lancashire Skills Hub whose job it is to create the conditions for a balanced, skilled and inclusive labour market to underpin economic well-being, productivity and growth across the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership area. Good morning, Michelle. Are you there? Cole, Michelle, good morning to you. How are you, sir? Sir, ma'am. How are you? Well, thank you. I'm, I'm fine, thank you very much, Richard. Good to are see you. you. Be having, are you going to be having a busy apprenticeship week? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Promoting apprenticeships. Fantastic. Struggling I mean, it's in Lancashire. So it's uh, there's some amazing stories coming through on Twitter and LinkedIn from different businesses and the value that their apprentices are giving. Um, so, yeah, fabulous to celebrate this week. No, it is. I mean, the, camp the national campaign is great. I'm glad to see so much activity across the county and I'm glad we're part of it. So, Michelle, tell us... What why do we, what's this, what is the strategic importance of apprenticeships for our Lancashire economy? Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of apprenticeships, it's growing our talent base. Um, and there's two lenses to that, I think. One is the economy and supporting our businesses to get the skills that they need um, and to grow our talent base, to attract other businesses to come and live, work and play in Lancashire. But also that inclusive lens in terms of maximising opportunities for Lancashire people, um, whether it be young people or adults, fantastic way to develop the skills and build their employability. And you'll know at the moment, you know, we've discussed it um, at various round tables that at the moment the dial has switched in Lancashire from famine to feast on vacancies. Um, you know, lots of recruitment challenges at present, which, you know, is good that the economy is starting to switch back on. Um, and we're seeing more demand. So apprenticeships are a fantastic way to kind of build that talent base and bring new talent into the, uh, into businesses. What kind of impact, Michelle, has the, the pandemic had on apprenticeships in terms of how it's affected the learners and how it's affected the businesses and even the providers? 
Yeah, so the pandemic, obviously, early on, it did have a significant impact on our apprentices. We saw quite a number furloughed. We saw our apprentices put on a break in learning. Um, and we saw a significant reduction in the starts as well as you would, you know, as you would expect. Um, but saying that, we're seeing uh, that start to recover now. Um, there was a lot of commitment, I think, from employers to try and enable their existing apprentices to complete their apprenticeship. Um, so if you look at the data now, we've got just over 10,000 apprentices across Lancashire. Um, that was of July 2021, so that was for the academic year. Um, that was 3,000 less than in 2018-19, so if you compare kind of the last year pre-pandemic. However, what we're seeing is an acceleration in starts. So if you look along the last three quarters of data that we've had, it's gone a jump of 18 percent then a jump of 29 and then a jump of 39 percent so that's really demonstrating that employers uh, are rolling their sleeves back up you know uh, recruiting apprentices you know we've got a lot of interest from young people in apprenticeships now as well and um, it's a real valued route for young people for adults to come i think I, I wonder michelle i mean as a, as a small business myself who, who recently um gone down the apprenticeship line and it's a great feeling by the way um how do we support businesses in the county a to persuade them of the benefits of apprenticeships and then to help them through the process of of um, apprenticeships yeah i mean there's a fabulous connected system across lancashire with a whole host of different colleges private providers the Lancashire Workplace Learning Forum that brings those partners together. Um, so, you know, there is an easy way to engage. We've got the Lancashire Apprenticeship Service um, and also um, more recently the Lancashire Levy Transfer Network as well, where our larger employers in Lancashire have committed half a million quid from unspent levy um, to businesses across Lancashire who don't, you know, who, who uh, need funding to support their apprenticeship provision. So we're seeing uh, companies getting matched up. We're seeing levy being transferred. So it's not going back to Treasury, which is great. Keep it in Lancashire. Mm. Um, you know, so that's um, starting to rock and roll as well. I think 60,000 has been transferred so far, and that is going to go really quickly. So uh, businesses need to get engaged, um, you know, and, and kind of access that funding. And that's any company that can access that if they've got, you know, a, a desire to recruit apprentices, whatever level um as well so um so that's a fantastic opportunity for people so there were some phrases there that you used michelle we talked about the levy and i'm an, i understand the, the levy and I understand but it's it's caused some problems and it's also cre created some great opportunities but i think i think would it be fair michelle to say to our viewers and our readers to say don't worry about that there are people who can look after the nuts and bolts for you absolutely yeah our providers are well versed in traversing the ins and outs of uh, you know the policy and processes around apprenticeships and so can support businesses to get involved so whether you know it's a company that's never recruited apprenticeships before whether it's a company that recruited a couple of years ago wants to jump back in and i think you know the plethora of opportunities now um apprenticeships have grown like topsy in terms of the number of employer standards you know so the qualifications are driven by employers, they're developed in collaboration with employers. And we've got from kind of intermediate skills at kind of level two, uh, which is kind of the GCSE level, right through to degree apprenticeships and everything in between. So there's a huge scope in terms of uh, level of skill, but also in terms of subject area. So, you know, you think about your traditional manufacturing, construction apprenticeships, et cetera, yeah. but, you know, there's a whole host of opportunities, paralegal, accounting, you know, everything you could possibly think of. Um, There's even space. digital apprenticeships in the publishing sector, Michelle. There is indeed, yes. There's so, so many different opportunities. Now, I know you've got, you've got to get off to some other events now and, and weave your magic with other apprenticeship projects. But before you do that, just a message for our businesses, really. What do they need to do next? Um, whether we're talking to businesses who, um, in our audience who are referring to their clients or the businesses themselves, what do they need to do next to get onto the journey of apprenticeships? Yeah, so an easy way to, um, to engage is to sign up to the Lancashire Skills Pledge. So the Lancashire Skills Pledge was developed with partners, including all the wonderful providers of apprenticeship provision. Um, and other partners to um, to give an easy front door to employers 
to find out about the provision that's available to them. Um, so it's dead easy, just search Lancashire Skills Pledge, sign up, and that will click you through to um, the Lancashire Work-Based Learning Forum, which will have the conversation about what's your business needs, where can apprenticeships add value, and connect you through to providers. So it's dead easy. And the Lancashire Skills Pledge is there as well. We've got um, 120 odd businesses signed up so far, That's making good. 230 pledges. It's a build it, you know, it's a growing group. And it's there to really recognise the employers that are committed to inspiring, recruiting and developing the people of Lancashire. Um, Michelle Lodi-Jones, you are inspiring yourself. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today, Michelle. Um, wish you all the best and good luck getting Lancashire further engaged on apprenticeships. Thank you very much, Michelle, Michelle Lodi-Jones. Now, next up is our first panel of business people and skills providers. Our theme for this panel, borrowed, from a national campaign is train and later will come to retain and achieve. In the meantime, would you please welcome from the skills providers, Hannah Cutler, who's head of apprenticeships at Burnley College, Colleen Hickson, who's head of apprenticeships at Blackpool and the Fylde College, and the, from the worlds of business, please welcome Ian MacDonald, regional apprenticeship manager of Persimmon Homes, and Gabriella Hammond, who's the head of human resources at Vika. Good morning to you all, or good morning to some of you. I can see three of you at the moment. Um, Ian MacDonald, I'll start with you if I may. Um, Ian, there's a lot of change in our businesses at the minute. We've got digitalization coming into it. We've got your business, it has traditional skills, but you have new requirements. Um, how, do you, how do you plan your future skills needs and how do you wrap apprenticeships into that, Ian? In terms of the planning going forwards, we've realized that um, in the past, we perhaps haven't invested as much as we could have done. We did take apprentices previously, but um, as a business regionally and nationally, we realised, particularly as the pandemic has kicked in and we've managed to keep work as much as we can through the pandemic, that we've got that huge skills shortage. So the investment going forward from our point of view is that we're looking to get the people in, offer them that opportunity of the full career progression because I think sometimes I think particularly with construction side of things as you mentioned there's a lot of traditional sort of image there as a business but there is a lot of advance and the digital side of things coming off the back of it which perhaps isn't always recognized within construction side of things so we've gone from having five or six apprentices traditional bricklaying and joinery type apprentices last year and when I joined Persimmon um, from the late summer last year we've now got 29 apprentices within our business just within Lancashire nice. and as you've mentioned earlier there's a huge variety there we've got the traditional trades through to customer care we're looking at our digital design and our engineering side of things and we're really pushing that and investing that and offering these people that progression because we can see it from our point of view as a business there's a huge demand out there for our product and we need these people coming through to work with us and to be our managers and our designers and people of the future. And without them, we can't function as a business. And per perhaps, you know, if you just to give us a little bit on, um, I'm, I'm aware of some of the roles that you offer through apprenticeships and, and you've gone, you, you go beyond what I think people would see as those traditional roles. How far into the business are apprenticeships now uh, leaking? <laughs> it's hard really not to, to find an area within the business that doesn't have an apprenticeship somewhere within that structure or within that functionality within the business so in terms of out on site we've got the trade side of it but right through we've got some people at the moment that are training as um, training site managers who have come from a sales background and some of them are having career changes late in life and similarly within the back office side of things and the um, design and the management and the financial control we've, pretty, we've got apprentices at pretty much every level including up to degree level within our business as well some of our engineering team are currently doing degree level apprenticeships as well so there's it's 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 all pervading <laughs> yeah no no i appreciate that Ian. and thanks i'm just gonna nice segue i've just realized they're available to us here so we're going to move from the home builder to the home improver um gabriella hammond as the home improving business in our in our midst gabriella how do you plan for future skills needs how do you manage the digitalisation process and where do apprenticeships fit in? Our story is very much the same as Ian's. Um, for years, we've done traditional apprenticeships. So started with engineering, manufacturing, moving into business admin. Um, but in the last sort of pandemic hit um, times, we, we very much put it as part of the strategy for an ongoing recruitment agenda 
in terms of our manufacturing base, um, where we'd never really looked at an apprenticeship before. But in, in terms of, of where our recruitment needs are going forward and the development of the people, that's where our apprenticeships fit. So that's what we've done this year, up to the numbers of apprenticeships for that particular area. So is your, is your um, environment similar to that that Ian described, where it's not just new starters, it's, it's, it's new skills being uh, developed within and throughout the business? Yeah, so we, we similarly do um, different apprenticeships in different areas. Focus this year is on new intake, um, but, but we, we've, we've obviously got apprenticeships in, in skilled areas for longer serving employees as well. Thank you. Um, Hannah Cutler, if I can come to you, we, what, what I've enjoyed there, hearing there is the description of traditional skills, modern skills, contemporary skills, digital skills, all with this apprenticeship um, wraparound. So it strikes me there's a challenge there of managing the traditional with the contemporary. How do you manage that challenge and where do you fit in, Hannah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's colleges and providers' responsibilities to provide the education and training that meets the needs of the businesses, with it, whether it be traditional current skills or the future skills. Um, so where we fit in is that as a college, we are heavily uh, engaged with all our employers. And that's real engagement to make sure that the curriculum is reflective uh, of those skills challenges, but also supportive of the Lancashire pillars of growth, um, Verley College operates at both a strategic and operational level, working with all industry leaders to understand what's happening within their business and how to support them um, and develop curriculum that is both academic and vocational, but fit for purpose, relevant and agile to what their needs are. So that, that suggests to me that the that there's, um, I mean, we do, we do refer to this, but it's, it's to remind ourselves, I think, it suggests that the businesses that you work with are there to influence your curriculum to make it relevant to themselves. Is that a fair summary? No, it absolutely is. And, and here at the college, we hold lots of different vision groups and advisory boards. Um, so, for example, Gabriella is part of our, one of our advisory boards on the advanced uh, manufacturing and engineering. And it's those employers that will develop and steer the curriculum, ensuring that what we offer as a college is fit for purpose and that can be entry level right up to your level six and seven uh, apprenticeship degrees and masters. Thank you. Uh, Colleen Hickson, um, you're quite innovative with your apprenticeships as well. You, you're good at spotting opportunities for the future. Um, so how, again, it's that, that idea of traditional and contemporary bringing digital aspects into all of our workplaces. Where do you see the challenges and where do you see the opportunities there, Colleen? I think very similar to what Hannah says, it comes from our employers and the intelligence that they bring. Yes, we've got the uh, labour market intelligence for the local region, national, um, but it's about our employers that we that are in our local communities, that we work really, really closely with them. We are led by them, so helping them to, um, to, to create content for the apprenticeships that really supports what they need in their business to add that value so that employers can can really feel that return on investment um, and, and I suppose that that is the key for us. Thank you if I come back to you Ian, Ian do you, do you feel that it does it feel like a team game to you between yourselves and the skills providers and the apprentice the apprentices themselves? Yeah very much so I mean without that or link between all three parties it, it just can't function and having the right delivery from the providers and making it relevant to the industry and having that buy-in from the apprentices and they can see that link because if they can see the link between the delivery and what they're doing in work then you get that commitment and buy-in from them as well and it's a, it's a self-perpetuating circle and everybody works in together and without that it's it can often stall or stumble but so that relationship and that communication between the providers the employer and the apprentices is key and it's if that is the, the the hub of the whole process. If that works well, the whole process works well, and you get happy, successful employees out the end of the process who want to continue working for us and want to develop as well. So that is the key process, definitely. Thank you, and, and Gabrielle. We heard mentioned there that, that you're on the the skills board for the for the Burnley area. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and how how you feel you contribute and what you get back what you get back from it. It's the um, 
just the discussion and the communication around each business that's on the panel and what are their priorities, what's their future strategy, is that fitted by the college standards at the moment, is there anything new, um, what are we looking at in five years time and there's a bit of backwards and forwards, what about this, or maybe we, we could try something completely different and it's just that, again, that relationship. Thank you very much. Colleen, I'm just going to open the conversation out a little bit um, now, if I may. Um, what do you see as our urgent skills priorities and what, do, what are you particularly working on at Blackpool and the Files, Colleen? So I, I think that the, the green technologies is something that we are um, developing, working with our employees. Again, that employers central to those conversations about things that they will need to add into their business. So upskilling their existing workforce and then starting to look at um, the skills that need to be embedded into apprenticeships moving forward so that they are um, enabling their apprentices to bring those new fresh ideas uh, into the business. So that, that's one of our big, big key um, uh, things for the next uh, three to five years. So that, that that green agenda, that whole I think I think we're I think we're moving towards calling it now the ESG agenda, the environmental, yeah, social, yeah. and governance agenda. Yeah. That's part of what you're you're dealing with. And I'm looking ahead to other opportunities. We've got you know, the National Cyber Force has been announced. So are they the kind of things that uh, you as a skills provider can get involved in, Colleen? Yeah, definitely. Um, as far as, uh, with us being so close as well with BAE in Salisbury, so the National Cyber Force, as we know, is going to be based there. Our curriculum um, is always looking to the future. So when we are doing our uh, planning with our employers, we're looking at the next five year trends, 10 year trends so that we are able to be positioned um, to support the, the future skills. So, yeah, we're working really closely um, uh, to, to ensure that we can support. Oh, thank you very much. And Hannah, to you, similar question, really. What, what do you feel are the priorities that we face as a county and where do you best fit into solving those problems? Yeah, I mean, again, very similar to Colleen, um, we are working really closely with the Green Agenda and looking at the sustainability framework and how we can embed that within curriculum across all curriculum levels, supporting our employees, but also that agenda moving forward. Um, we're developing lots of areas within and around college, um, looking at new campus, new sites, um, to develop around the, the five pillars of growth, so your tourism, culture, digital, advanced manufacturing, uh, energy, uh, and obviously health and science. Um, but again, it's very much creating opportunities uh, for young people and upskilling and reskilling, uh, supporting all those business needs around us. And those, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned those uh, pillars of growth. Am, am I right in saying, are they the ones that are linked to the, the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership pillars? Yeah, yeah. So, um, we've, so we've got a dovetailing of st strategy from the Enterprise Partnership and delivery from your side. How does that work in practice, um, Hannah? Our senior leaders um, are part of all those different boards and will feed all that information into the curriculum teams, which then goes into the advisory boards and the vision groups to make sure that strategically we are following uh, what is needed in the local area, um, right from the top, uh, right down to what we deliver uh, in all the different curriculum areas. Thank you. I'm, I mean, I'm quite assured, I don't know about you, Gabriella, what do you think? I, I'm, I'm quite assured that, that, that there is a team game in play here and it feels good. It feels like we're all batting on the same side. Is that what it feels to you? Certainly. I think more so now than ever. Um, the, each, the companies can see the benefit of creating that link. And whereas in, say, the past 10 years, maybe that link wasn't there. It, it certainly is, and I think the colleges and providers can see that more rather than just having a off the shelf package. It actually helps them to understand where they need to take their skills uh, provision. Thank you, and and Ian, to you uh, as your industry changes, and, and there are some fabulous um, innovations coming into the home building sector. How do you see the skills conversation changing for you over the next five to ten years, Ian? I think the, the traditional side of things will always be there and there's always that demand. But as you say, the the progression and the technology advancements going on, the green agenda, the carbon zero, because um, we're looking and planning ahead for the next 15, 20 years with sites we have yeah. looking coming down the line. Um, so things like your EV charging points and your um, communal heating systems and schemes and these kind of things that we're looking at and trying to get the whole build process down to 
carbon neutral. So there's a lot of technology involved in that side of things, a lot of advanced planning to go on. Again, the government agendas are there and the timescales for those. And some of those are quite challenging um, and they're coming up quite fast. So we all need to be, I think construction industry in particular is probably seen as quite a, an archaic almost, if you like, in some respects, especially maybe the house building, but it, it, we're having to move, it has to progress. We've got to keep up with the times. We've got to be planning ahead and that technology and that advancement and the opportunities that offers is something that we're keen to engage with, but also make people aware of those opportunities. Because again, the skill shortage aspect of it and trying to get people to engage with apprenticeships is having that, raising that awareness for the population out there, not just the potential young candidates coming through, but the families and the influences behind them as well to say, look, this is a, in all sectors, it's all advancing, there's huge opportunities out there and it's just raising that awareness. And I think that partnership that's been spoken about in terms of the employers and the providers all working together, National Apprenticeship Week this week is obviously a big part of that in promoting yeah. those opportunities and trying to get that message out there, not just the advantages to businesses, but if businesses engage, to get that message out and to help the recruitment side of it. Because I think everybody's struggling to get the right number of people in and the right quality of candidates in because they're just not aware of what's out there. So that partnership working and the events this week are, are going to be a huge part of that and help push that along as well, I think. So. Well, I, I very much hope so. Now, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to finish with one question, which I'm going to try and remember to ask all of our panellists today. And, it, and it's this. Um, if you could bring for and brief answers, please, if you wouldn't mind. If you could bring forward an initiative for next year's National Apprenticeship Week, Colleen, what would it be? It would be based around making sure that every single SME across Lancashire engages in apprenticeships and, and realises the benefits within their business. I think we should stop the conference. That's 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 the message. Isn't it? <laughs> we're, we're done. Uh, yeah, we like that. You're getting applause from the boys in the studio here, um, right? Who who wants to follow that? So. Um, if you could bring forward an initiative for next year's National Apprenticeships Week, what would it be, Hannah Cutler? I would have a 365 day uh, apprenticeship celebration because it's every day that our apprentices and our employers achieve great things. Liking this. Ian McDonald, what would your initiative be for next year's National Apprenticeships Week? I think it would be the focus on the parents and the schools to get their, get their awareness and to focus on them, definitely. Because there's a huge shortage of what they're aware of. Uh, can somebody tell me which department of government we should be sending all this information to? Because this is great stuff. Uh, Gabriella, what would your initiative be for next year's National Apprenticeships Week? Um, Ian actually just pinched mine. It was about um, <laughs> promotion of, uh, of awareness to parents. But, but very quickly thinking on my feet, it would be around inclusion in every apprenticeship, some life skills oh, for the apprentice. That. So the understanding of, of there's more that they need to do in their development about um, communication, about learning about resilience, et cetera, et cetera. Can I just ask Colleen, Hannah, uh, very quickly, is that part of an apprenticeship programme, those, those life skills or softer skills, or is it a bit harder than that, Colleen? Absolutely. Uh, the personal development curriculum is embedded across every single apprenticeship that we deliver. Hannah? Yeah, absolutely agree with what Colleen has said. Gabriella, I think we can be assured by that. And uh, if that's not the service we're getting, we will do soon, won't we? Ladies and gentlemen, how about that? What a great start. They were fantastic. Please, please give it up for a fabulous training panel or train panel. Now, for a moment, let's step away from strategy and meet an apprentice. For a moment, let's just get a view from the workplace. Ready, ready, ready? I'm going to do it. Rob, roll VT. My name is Bethany Cobb, I'm a Themis Mechatronics Apprentice and I work for the Senator Group. The Senator Group is a family run business so as soon as you come in you're treated as one of the family and that's great because it really pushes you and the feel of acceptance I guess. I chose an apprenticeship because I really needed a change in my career. I was 26 when I was looking and the opportunity to earn while I learn was something that I was really interested in. The career dream is to be the robot specialist at the Senator Group and I'm working on that. We've installed the robots now and from start to finish I've been involved. Um, I've really forced myself into that involvement. It's not always been voluntary for the other engineers but <laughs> um, so yeah, robot specialist, there's a lot to learn. Themis have been incredible and the trainer has been so supportive. I was so happy to find out that I was nominated for the Ingenuity Awards. I'm really looking forward to the ceremony. It's going to be amazing.
how good was that ladies and gentlemen and a big thank you to the senator group to burnley college and especially to apprentice bethany cobb for our second panel our focus is retain the second of the three apprenticeship week strands and would you please welcome from the skills providers claire shaw senior business development manager of blackburn college also with us robin linday operations manager of nltg formerly known as Northanks Training Group. With us, we also have Martin Blunt, who's the Enterprise Engagement Unit Manager at the University of Central Lancashire. And from the world of business, we have Rob Pipe, Production Manager, or rather Production Operations Manager at Plums, and Director of Redfern. Please welcome Mr. Sean Redfern. Now, this conversation is designed to demonstrate the levels of apprenticeships that are available from level two, which is an approximate GCSE equivalent, to level seven, which is an approximate master's equivalent. Welcome to you all. Um, if I may, Claire Shaw, can I start with you? How do you demonstrate value and measure success from apprenticeship programmes? So I think, Richard, the Ian in the last panel mentioned the, the three key points in which you can demonstrate value to the business and to the apprentice. And he spoke really clearly, didn't he, about the need for planning for the training, the importance of recognising the training as an investment, and the fact that that investment ultimately leads to progression. Um, and he also spoke about the need for all three parties to work together in terms of ourselves, in our cases, Blackburn College is the training provider, working with the employer and working with, in, in our panel's case, the existing employee to develop their progression. And I think it's about asking those really key questions at the start of that apprenticeship conversation in terms of what is the individual looking to get out of the programme and development? What's the business looking to get out of it? Um, and I think in simple terms, that's the way that um, the impact is monitored and measured. So is it at that point that you set objectives and, and expectations? How, how does it work is, is a little bit of my question. Yeah, absolutely. Setting objectives. And again, it's important to set objectives for the individual who's going to do the apprenticeship because they will have come to that journey, presumably with a, an individual learning need once. Let's say they're going to be an operational manager and they're looking to up, upskill themselves but the business will also have some wants and needs out of that individual so it's looking at both objectives and looking at what skills the individual already brings to the program and um, they may have had a complete career change and the skill level they bring to that new job might not be um, so great might be limited but they might bring some skills and we'd need to adapt the program and adjust it to accommodate that and um, so objective setting is probably one of the most important things you can do because some of the programmes that our panel will be talking about can be quite lengthy and somebody's role in work can change through that time. And it's important as with every aspect of work to keep looking back and seeing where we set out to go. Even if that journey's changed, we just need to reflect on that. So yeah, objectives, absolutely key. Thank you very much. Uh, Robin, if I can come to you. Um, similarly, I mean, it's about demonstrating value, measuring success, because that's what employers, I think, want to understand. Um, they want to understand their investment as an investment rather than a cost, and they're going to want to know what's coming back. And I suppose, especially for businesses that might be new to the game, like my own, we're a little bit uncertain. So I suppose what I'm asking you to do is, can you can you give us some reassurance and, and tell us how we provide value and how we measure success? Oh, apologies. Yes, thank you. I was bound, bound to be the first one to make that mistake this morning. Uh, I, I think kind of picking up on um, uh, some of the comments that have already been made around that kind of partnership um, uh, approach. I think that, that's so very important. And it's interesting, Richard, that, that you mentioned that term um, kind of investment. I think absolutely seeing it as an investment um, is, uh, is crucial. Um, I think uh, Apprenticeships for me are so much more than just a certificate. It's not just um, a piece of paper at the end of it. Um, it's really about understanding how do we make a, a kind of lasting um, difference 
um, in, in the shape, really change the shape of that individual. The, the previous panel is mentioned um, about the kind of the, the broader skills, the broader learning, the broader experience that, that a friendship can bring. I think that's absolutely crucial as well. Um, looking not just at a series of modules that I need to complete, a series of exams that I need to pass, but really, you know, where am I at the start of this um, journey? You know, what do I look like? And, and having a conversation with, with that employer that says, do you know what, what do you need them to look like at the end of this process? Yeah. And that will be much more than, than a, a kind of tick box list of, of skills. It'll be about behaviours. It'll be about the, the ways of working. It'll be about um, that sense of belonging within that organisation. So I think a much rounded, much more rounded um, uh, individual should be coming out at the end of that process. And I think, uh, as we're talking about in terms of retention, I think it's absolutely crucial at the moment with um, uh, you know the kind of the great resignation as, as, as people are, are referring to. Um, uh, we've kind of I think the stats shows that one in four people are kind of thinking about um, uh, moving on from. Uh, their current role, I think as a way to retain um, your very best talent, apprenticeships are a fantastic opportunity to do that um, for people, no matter how long they've been, been with you, there'll be something, um, some area that they can develop. And I think in setting out what really is it, as Claire's just said, that that, that organisation needs, that that individual needs, um, we can make a real difference there to, to the business as a whole. Thank you. Uh, Martin from uh, UCLAN, Martin Blunt, how do you get our employers to articulate those objectives? Because I imagine for some it might be straightforward, they might understand, they might have a um, very specific need or a well-established need. For others it might be something quite new, it might become something quite difficult for them. Uh, and I know it sits alongside uh, a recruitment and retention strategy, a typical recruitment and retention strategy, but it's that articulation of need. I wonder, I wonder how, how varied it is across the business piece. Martin Blunt. There, thank you, Richard. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I think this is about the engagement at the very beginning of the journey, to be honest with you. Um, jargon is, is horrendous in the apprenticeship world and the education world as it, as it is, but um, Sitting down with the line manager and the potential apprentice is, is absolute key. I think this is really where you can start to spell out exactly what that journey will be, those, those challenges, that work-life balance with, with the study, um, and also the job in itself is, is obviously going to be quite a challenge. So I think it's very much about that tripartite discussion, really, that's done, the journey of the learning, the modules that you're going to go through, but really those benefits. And that's really where that learning that they do becomes a project based an assignment that's related to the work in, you know, in their job. And that's where the two start to really come together, um, which I think is probably one of the biggest benefits, really. So a lot of businesses could come to us with um, no idea really what what they really want. And I think it's that um, that's almost uh, engagement discussion that needs analysis approach really to sort of identify exactly what we can do as part of our course, how we tailor it really to fit the apprentice and, and the line manager and the organization as a whole. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's very much a sort of the beginning stages, I would say. Um, yeah, so does that answer that one? No, no, no that, that's great. I was just I was enjoying listening to you, sir, frankly. <laughs> and, I, and I will come back because we're going to hear some more from you shortly. Um, Rod Pipe at Plums, um, how do you use a really simple question? How do you use apprenticeships at what levels and and how do you view, no, let's leave it at that. I'll come to the second part of the question. How do you use apprenticeships and at what levels? Okay, Richard, morning all. So we open our apprenticeships up across the operations areas. Um, initially starting off at a level two, but developing on to level three and furniture and soft furnishings to bring the apprentices on. Now, just listening to the group and what they've discussed this morning, the opportunities there for all of us to embrace our apprentices and actually get on the same journey that they're on. So setting objectives, having regular reviews. Just looking at um, Rob Lindsay from North Bank Training Group, we actually work quite closely with one of the tutors from there and actually set about a monthly meeting whereby we'll get the tutor to the site, we'll get the apprentice in the room and we'll, we'll go through the process in terms of where, where are we at the moment, what do we need to do next, how are we going to get there and, and get on board with that journey get, and really take them through the process. If we don't do that, why should they? Yeah. Why, why, yeah. Why, so, we have to invest in people. So you, you, you're showing a commitment. 
you, you feel it's important as a business to show commitment to project, project apprenticeships and the apprentices themselves? Absolutely. I think if we show that we care about how well they're doing in the apprenticeship, then they'll come on that journey with us and, 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 and they'll stay with us at the end of it. Um, aside so, from that, sorry, you want Richard? No, I was just going to say, it doesn't lead me on to that idea of, of retention or retention strategy. Can you, can you spot a difference? Is there a, is there a different approach to retention? Uh, does, do you do well retaining people by taking them through this, this route? Or tell us how it is. So I'd say it was fairly mixed. Um, we, have, we, we do have strong retention levels across the business, um, but there is the odd one or two that does tend to slip through the net. Um, that may be because that they've actually just found that they've lost their way a little bit and it wasn't actually for them. They've got a bigger appetite to go somewhere else. Uh, but as a whole, we, we do fairly well as, a, as, as an organisation for apprenticeships. We've got a Looking back through the history, what you did through this week, about a total of 68 persons that have gone through either apprenticeships or what was born with the MVQ process. Nice. Uh, and we've done well to retain a lot of them. So we also look at how we can step down into the next level. So whilst I said before we start at level two, we will push them on to further their development onto level three and level four into sort of team leader management qualifications as well. That's great stuff. Thanks ever so much. Uh, Sean Redfern um, from Redfern, uh, can you tell us please a little bit about the way you use apprenticeships and, and what it is you feel they bring to your business and what you need to invest in in those people? Yeah, um, yeah. thanks Richard. Thanks for having me on. I I mean, I think if I lean on our journey with apprenticeships so far over the last two years, we've got two apprentices in the business. We're an 18 strong agency as such. But those two apprentices have really... I suppose, given me the confidence to move forward with more apprentices. And at this point in time, we're actually looking to take on an additional five apprentices into their own agency. So we're going to create an agency that is purely run by apprentices, um, which will then become a talent pool to come up to the bigger agency. So it's that, that journey of working with the college. And I think Anna mentioned it, it was a key point on the last part of the, of the call, was that we're, we are influencing that curriculum we're influencing the software that they use um the students are engaging with that we've got six students coming up to the agency this friday to we're going to give them a commercial brief so they're actually going to work on a commercial project whilst in the college so they get that exposure to a commercial environment and then when they come up to this new agency that will be run by apprentices and mentored by ourselves they have a, a one an 18 month journey i think it is for level three something like that into the bigger agency and and we can retain that that talent by having that continuous journey of college training into the agency into the bigger agency and just continue i suppose giving them the exposure to the culture i think if you get by get students into your culture as a business at the early stage they will stick with you a lot longer than you would if you was going down a the the journey which is What's your strategy there, Sean, in terms of um, throughput in uh, through that the the the, the how did, the apprenticeship agency? Yeah. What's your What's your intention for for what happens next, and how big can you grow that idea? Yeah. So, well, the intention is we've just recently been approved the funding um, with Burnley Council and the Innovation and Growth Fund to to help us on that journey. Um, we were down at Burnley College last two weeks ago for the uh, careers event. We had about 20 students came in and it was really surprising and exciting, you know, seeing the different personalities that come in. We had a 15 year old lad turn up with a business card and he was always already running his videography business. Then you have another student that comes in. He was like a 40 year old guy in a 15 year old's body with so much charisma. And, you know, he was a salesman before he even knew he was going to be a salesman, to be honest. But that journey of getting those types of individuals into the business is just engaging with Burnley. Burnley College is obviously our local college. So as long as we have that engagement and we can influence that curriculum and we can continue that conversation every month, it needs to happen every month, uh, you know, which, 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 pardon me, which students are coming through and, you know, what skills, what career path are they looking to achieve, whether it's digital marketing, technology, whatever that might be, and just keep that conversation running. Yeah. So you're going to grow your own, but you're going to be growing them for the other agencies, I guess, in, in the region, aren't you? Potentially, yeah. I did actually speak to another agency on and he said, how much commission would you need if we could take some off you as well? So, <laughs> um, But yeah, no, it's, again, it's, it's a talent pool. And I suppose to touch on the title of what we're talking about from a retain perspective, you know, Manchester, the bright lights as such from an agency land is 
our challenge. And I think the investments that are happening around Burnley with, you know, the universities, the colleges and, yeah. and Blackburn and the surrounding areas, that has to ramp up as well to keep those people in the areas um, for that local infrastructure as well, yeah. No, I've got that. Thank, thank you very much. Now, um, Claire Shaw, I'm going to come back to you. We've we've heard from employers, we've heard from providers, and everyone feels good. You know, if, if, if those that are, that are engaged in apprenticeships are liking being engaged in apprenticeships, and given that we can take people through from level two to level seven to extraordinary skill levels, I just wonder what are the barriers that are stopping some businesses getting on board with this, Claire? So there are a few, Richard. Um, one of the barriers is a lack of information and a lack of understanding. And um, in spite of everything that we all collectively do, everything that you do, um, as, a, as a, a media business, everything we do as training providers and everything that the business ambassadors that we're hearing from today do, in spite of all of that, there are still businesses who've perhaps not taken time to hear that message. Mm. So the, a lack of information understanding is one barrier. And I think the other barrier is perhaps a mismatch between what the individual wants, who's trying to progress within the business, and what the um, employer wants yeah. and maybe what the training provider knows needs to happen for this program to be an apprenticeship and i think one thing that we've not said yet this morning which is really important is that when we're developing people within businesses sometimes it doesn't turn out to be an apprenticeship opportunity and that's okay too and yeah. all of us who are apprenticeship providers will help direct and steer to something else that suits the individual and the business and I think it's just so important to say that we don't just have to ram through that barrier if it doesn't fit it doesn't fit and um, so for example we run um, multiple programs on um, human resources development the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development in those same groups we've got some people who are going through an apprenticeship route we've got some who are going through an individually commercially funded route and that's because the skills they've already brought to the job mean that they just need a few bits of that jigsaw to get them on the way yeah. and the certification. So I think in terms of barriers, we're back to the honest conversation, the understanding and information and a shared objective. And um, the one thing that definitely isn't a barrier anymore is the funding for an apprenticeship. And um, I think time might be perceived as a barrier. But when you listen to somebody such as Sean or Rob talking about how they've woven business projects into the necessary training, time doesn't need to be a barrier either. Thank you very much. Um, Martin Blunt, um, this, this, this retention piece, I just want to stick, stick with that. How much of your pitch to uh, employers and businesses is we can really help you not only recruit, not only upskill, but retain how much how much do you put that as part, as part of your pitch it's, it's almost central to be honest with you um the the whole point of uh, upskilling your incumbent members of staff is is of absolute necessity there's a huge aging workforce um coming through there are new skills the the you know the curriculum when you're looking at actually what is taught yesterday we had a national apprenticeship week event um, with royal mail and one of our uh, apprentices there who's graduated said I came in at quite an advanced entry, to be honest with you, but so I never considered apprenticeships to be a solution for me. But when it was actually like Claire just stated, that information that's given at the beginning, and once that knowledge is, is understood, he realized I can learn more, I can sort of stay with the organization, I can refresh my skills as well. Um, and that really makes a, a, a significant difference, really. And because um, this is, again, another factor, really, with, with upskilling is the fact that your internal members of staff is the fact that you can jump in at level, oh, sorry, year two or year three, depending on what prior experience you have. So it's a shorter course, though it doesn't seem as, as sort of overwhelming when you're looking at a, a degree apprenticeship, for example, in mechatronics, which is a six year or five year program, but actually it can be reduced down to three years. So it's um it's it's really imperative really that they you know people reach out find out you know look into the uh, opportunities really that you have um and it's that career pathway um approach really as well i think it's understanding as, as was said on the previous panel engaging with the parents the, the students the a-level students college students etc that actually 
they can don't just need to see what's just in front of them they can see where they could end up you know we've just put on a doctor well we've just written a doctor degree apprenticeship you know so you could start at a level three in senior healthcare support worker and go all the way through which is just phenomenal to have thought that is even going to be a possibility in the future so yeah wow it's it's a brilliant sort of transformation really for apprentices in my opinion wary if I am of busting through the fourth wall, <laughs> you've just had applause in the room for, the, for that <laughs> idea. We're, we're taking medics right through the process. We it's, like that, don't we? It's, <laughs> we a, it's a cultural change, though, isn't it? Now we're, we're you know we're really trying to encourage those schools to see that there is a fantastic choice that career pathway is is absolutely necessity, you know, for them. So you could do a level two in customer service and business admin and end up being a level seven senior leader. So it's just just brilliant to be able to sort of have that vision suddenly, which has, I think, been missing for quite some time. Thank you very much. Um, and, and Robin, I just wonder, what, what are your persuasion tactics when you've got um, a, a business that, that you're just trying to get over the line? Is retention part of your strategy? I think it absolutely is. And I think, um, coming back to some of the things that other, other people have mentioned, I think um, there's, a, there's a, a kind of brave uh, decision that, that all providers can make, which is, um, you know, saying to an employer, you know, make us work for you. You know, make us earn our our crust, and and we'll we'll kind of we'll put our necks on the block and, and say, this isn't uh, about just delivering that certificate at the end of the, of the process. We're making a promise to you and a commitment that we'll deliver a person with you know different range of, of skills, experiences, and abilities, and and that's quite a hopefully quite a persuasive uh, position to take. Uh, it's a brave one. Um, because it's, it takes a, a bit more um, uh, uh, effort and, and it, it's, it's harder, uh, but it's absolutely the right approach to take because it, it, it's, it's something that's going to benefit that individual and that business, not just now, but, but in the future as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please challenge Robin because he's ready for a challenge. One last yeah. challenge for all of you people now. One, one quick response. And as I say, this is my question that's carrying us through the day. Um, if you could bring forward an initiative for next year's National Apprenticeships, what would it be, Claire Shaw? Um, I would make a single payment to all apprentices to support the wage that they are on. Um, and I'd do it in National Apprenticeship Week. Um, there's lots in the news about how hard it is for all of us um, and it's really hard for some apprentices so I would want to do that to put some more money in their pocket and hey. to support the businesses. Somehow or other pay your apprentices the best that you can pay them. Um, Robin Lindsay what would your initiative be for next year's National Apprenticeships Week? I would uh, champion level two uh, qualifications I think it's, it's fantastic that we've got this this ladder that reaches higher than it's ever reached before but I think if if we've got some young people out there who can't reach the first rung, um, then we, we risk losing them. Um, we never, I would champion level two. And we must never take our, our eyes off those traditional first line skills on those, those first level skills that everybody starts at that point. Is that fair? Absolutely. Robin, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, uh, if you could bring forward an initiative for next year's National Apprenticeships Week, what would it be? I would try and influence government to get some incentives back for employers, to be honest with you. It was a brilliant scheme. Yes, all the paperwork was hard, but um, fantastic. Martin, can I, I'm just going to pause you a second. Martin, I missed what you said. There was a killer word. Um, could, you, could you start your answer again, please? Well, I will. Uh, drop the mic. Uh, it, it was more about um, influencing government to see if we can get some employer incentives back. They, they made a hell of a difference in a fantastic way for SMEs. And, but I also go back to Hannah's. I thought the celebration of success, I think, is categorically important, really. Well, you know, because it is so hard to balance that work life with work and, and projects, et cetera. So, um, yeah, they're mine. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a magic uh, wand available for you, Sean Redfern. Wave it and tell me what would your initiative be for next year's National Apprenticeships Week? Uh, it, it would align similar to what Martin just said, that um, as a business, we, we are always going to take apprentices on, but funding fast tracks that and increases the number of apprentices that you can take on as well. So, you know, the funding that we've just achieved is, is, is helping us to do that. So, uh, yeah, as much funding as possible for the businesses. Thank you. And a final word in this panel from Plums, Rod Pipe. You've got a, you've got a chance to make a change at National Apprenticeships Week. What is it going to be? I was actually taken up by the first panel, Richard. Um, but I wrote down two things, which was celebrate success all year round. Why wait until we just have one week to do it in February? 
And the second one was already taken on the first pattern as well, interestingly enough, which was to reach out to colleges and schools. We want to make sure that we're known and heard about more often. Uh, apprenticeships aren't fully understood yet for whether it's a new apprentice or someone within the workforce looking to move on. So that message is key to get out there. And that's what I'd like to see change. Absolutely superb, Rod. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Please give it up for Claire Shaw, Robin Lindy, Martin Blunt, Rod Pipe and Sean Redfern. Now, thank you all for that panel. We've got one more panel to come, but before we do that, it's time to head back to the workplace and see some more apprentices in action. Rob, roll VT. <laughs> My name's Danny Young, I'm the head chef. But I'm in charge of obviously a brigade of 15 at the minute. Uh, so that's like the food service, the ordering, the deal joints of the kitchen, fridge management. We came across North Lanks through uh, obviously quite a local company to us, um, quite well, uh, well known in the area. I'm working with North Lanks, the experience I've seen so far is good. Uh, very up to date, very, very informed with everything. You're up to date with all the college work. The assessors are here a couple of times a month. I was ex-apprentice, so I started when I was 16. An apprentice, um, so I've never obviously a head chef, so I've worked way up in the last six, uh, 11 years. My name is Matthew Marriott, I work at Northcote in Lango, it's a Michelin starred hotel, and I'm the apprentice chef. I'm working on the larder section, so I do a mix of prep and a mix of lunch service and evening service. North Lanks training group was recommended to me by Courtney, who's head of HR, and the balance between learning in the kitchen and also online it seemed a great. Working with North Lanks and North Coast, I think it's great because you, you don't spend a day at, at college. It's all on the job learning and also theory wise is online, so it works well. I definitely recommend doing an apprenticeship with NLTG because it's a great balance between working and learning. I'm Jack Hayes, I'm an apprentice chef at North Coast Manor. Uh, I work on larder and I help set up canapes for lunch and dinner, and I also help set up uh, starters for lunch as well. I did work experience here when I was in the tail end of year 10 and I thought yeah, I really want to do this as a career in the future so I spoke to Courtney about it. And she offered me an apprenticeship and no thanks was the best one. The experience you get from working in a place like this you won't find anywhere else and no thanks helps with the work and theory side so much. I think the importance of the, the apprentices to business is, is massive. I think for me I look at it the way I did. I did 11 years from apprentice to now head chef. I think it's the same way. I got moulded as a as a young kid with no capability of doing anything. So then you was trained to how you, how they want you and how they want to mould you. So there's always going to be a job there for people and there's always going to be a future for someone. Many thanks to our friends at Northcote and NLTG for that fabulous video. And to former apprentice and now head chef, Danny Young, seen there with current apprentices, Matthew Marriott and Jack Hayes. Now we move into our third and final panel discussion. And for this, we are leaning towards how businesses can use apprenticeships to achieve, achieve being the buzzword in this one, their wider ambitions. Please welcome from the skills providers, Rowena Bruff, who's the work-based learning and apprenticeships uh, manager at Nelson and Combe College. We've also got in the house, Lindsay Monks, head of apprenticeships and employer engagement at Preston College. And from the world of business with Lisa Kennery, who's a director of Pierce Chartered Accountants. Now, what I'm hoping to take this conversation is just to show the breadth of businesses and sectors that can adopt apprenticeships and that are available to them. So let's start here. Um, if I can start with you, Lisa, if I may, what do apprenticeships, first of all, tell us what your business is, what it does and what apprenticeships bring to your business. Oh, Lisa, Lisa, let me... let's go again. That's, all, that's okay. So, so my question to you is just tell us a little bit about what your business is and what apprenticeships bring to your business. So we're an accountancy advisory group based in Blackburn. Um, we took an initial step to look at our recruitment strategy um, initial period and wanted to build up the future succession planning within the business. Um, apprentices have worked in tenfold in all different areas. Um, so we have currently 10 apprentices. We've got a headcount of 75 staff and we have 10 apprentices, Gosh. all within varied departments. Um, our accounts department, online services, 
uh, marketing, payroll. So it isn't just about one particular area, it's focusing across all of the business. Um, I think the objectives for us in terms of apprentices was to ensure that those that are doing a professional qualification also learn the softer skills. Um, they put the theory into practice, so what they are learning, putting that into practice and it's showing that they can apply that. Um, and as well, it aids the funding for that professional qualification. And what levels are they operating at? What, what levels of their apprenticeships are they at? Everything, Richard, from level two up to level seven. Gosh, um, right through the business. Yeah, right through the business, yes. Now, just casting your eyes, well, let's put, how about day-to-day -day operations? You described that you've got apprentices in, in pretty much across the, the business. Is there anywhere where apprenticeship, apprentices are not having an influence or, or um, an input on the business? Um, pretty much all of the departments that we have, we have an apprentice covering all of the areas um, of the business it is more prominent, I would say, in our accounts department at the moment. Yeah. So in terms of out of the 10, six of which sit in the accounts department. Um, but they have like a buddy, we have a buddying system. Um, so historically, all the trainees were in kind of a group. Um, but now we have a buddy system. So when someone starts, they've got that manager for support, um, myself if needed, but they've also got an extra buddy as well, which is their training partner, if you will, and they learn that way. And what what, what particular challenge you've worked in the you've, you've dealt with HR as parts of your role for a while. So, what, are there particular challenges and particular benefits that come from an apprenticeship program that may be different from a traditional hiring me mechanic? Yeah, I think from us the challenge is probably within our accounts and audit audit department is that they're getting that hands-on experience um, and technology has probably played a part in this. So historically, we would get a lot of manual books and records that would come in that allows us to start from the grassroots really for that apprentice to work the way through a job. Um, yeah. Whereas now technology has developed and a lot of the bookkeeping side of it is on an electronic system. So it's a, work, it's a different kind of working, um, which involves a different training aspect. And the, this conversation, this part of the event, this, this third of our panels, is about the word achieve and achievement from the use of apprenticeships. And I think it, if, if we were being realistic, it's about the achievement of, of the apprentices themselves as well as the businesses. And I wonder, what, what, how would you describe the achievements of Pierce from engaging in an apprenticeship programme? From us, I think um, it's amazing to see our colleague, our staff grow and develop as well as us growing as a business. Um, so to, I wanted to just give a real life example of an individual that Please. started his A-levels, um, decided that it wasn't for him and he wanted to look for another opportunity. Um, we employed him as an apprentice with North Anks Training Group, um, started off as an admin, worked through that, then begun professional qualifications for payroll, um, studied through that for a three-year programme and now has become a manager of the department. Um, it, so it just shows what they can, what they can do. These, these, are the, these are the stories, Lisa. We like stories like, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, and I think uh, as well, we've, got, we've just taken on thinking before the apprenticeships, um, the placements and the work experience and how important they are, I think. And I don't think all businesses get involved because sometimes it is it is difficult. Um, you are giving your time up um, for that training and that shadowing experience, but that develops into something else. So we've had placements previously um, that have developed onto an apprenticeship and now they're still with the firm. And um, we've just had a two month placement that has turned into a trainee apprenticeship again. So it really works getting in the in the initial period. Thanks, Lisa. I'm going to come back to you in a little while because okay. the next thing I want to talk to you about is about how you see apprenticeships play out in client businesses. But we'll come we'll come to that. Uh, Rowena Bruff from Nelson and Cone College, um, just tell us a little bit more about that because um, it's about achievement. This 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 part of the conversation. How, you, do you need to be shown or told what achievement means in order for you to match it, or are you able to? help your clients develop the idea of achievement? I think it starts from the very beginning, doesn't it? Going back to what Martin said and, and understanding the business needs and the long-term strategy. 
I think it's really important looking at the culture and the values because if we get that right at the very beginning, yeah. your achievement, you know, your retention will remain. You'll get long-term members of staff and then you'll see your succession planning because, as you've said, you know, Lisa said, you'll see the learners going through the apprenticeships right through your, the business <clears throat> to long-term goals. So I think it's understanding the business needs right at the very early stages and that achievement can be, you know, daily. You see the smiles on the face, I call it the belly buzz, where they're actually the engagement. Um, you, you know, you see the day-to-day -day challenges they get and they overcome and the resilience they get and developing the personal skills. So that's achievement in itself through to the very end when they achieve. They get, you know, if they get to gateway, they've finished all the learning, they get to that end point. And that end point assessment that these apprenticeships go through now is quite intense. It's almost as we're sat here on a panel, they're being judged by an external um awarding body um it, you know there's three parts to it so the achievement after that and the success um is immense and then obviously they can further the career from like we've described from level two right through to level seven so the next stage might be a three or a degree but, you know it's it's amazing that you know the, the achievements that you see coming through um is there a, is there a is, is there a point, I don't know, what, is, what do you would call it? Is a light bulb moment, I guess, with when you're speaking to employers and, and either prospects or current um, client employers, is there, is there a point at which they go, I get it now? And if there is, what's that point? It could be past history, where they've had past apprenticeships and they've experienced that achievement and the success of the business, because it might be they've improved productivity, the customer service, um, these young ones are quite innovative and they bring some fresh new, you know, fresh information, fresh um, excitement to a business, I think, sometimes. And it can kind of um, bring that pizzazz to a business and give it that future needs. I think the achievement for, there's, there's both achievement for the learner, the apprentice, and there's achievement for the actual employer, um, you know, and the successes. But I think the light bulb moment of either past history where it succeeded. Yeah. or where they actually are about to see it succeed. And bear in mind, they've got projects to deliver, as Martin said. So these projects are business-related that can make a big impact. Um, you know, they can present it to boards or management senior levels, and they can make a big impact on businesses. But it's obviously, throughout all this, it's the employer um, and their contribution that we need to make this succeed. Thanks very much. And uh, Lindsay Monks, um... <sighs> The breadth of apprenticeships is 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 immense, and the the, the standards or the levels rather are, are also very very impressive. But I guess businesses and individuals view achievement differently, uh, and I wonder how you can grab hold of that, catch capture that point of what it is that achievement means to a person as an individual or a business. And when we work together, what are we trying to achieve together? Given the disparity, given the, the, the stretched nature of difference of business and approach, how do you get hold of that achievement piece? Um, achievement for me, obviously, we've had two panels before here, which have been about the training and the retaining. And so achievement can't happen without those two things in the first place. It all works together. <laughs> But achievement is about definitely, I think it was Martin on the previous panel um, or, or Robin, that said, Robin that said it's not about the certificate. It, it, it's about the whole journey. You know, apprenticeships is a vehicle for to, to take you through different parts of, of your career as an individual. So it's about your progress, your destination, your career as an individual. But from the organization's point of view, the vehicle of an apprenticeship can really develop the organization. Uh, bring it up into to you know uh, be able to compete um, currently on that on that stage and you know in Lancashire we are you know battling to retain our our youth and our our expertise and our skills and not lose them to to our bigger cities that are close by so achievement can be seen by just being able to retain that workforce and and be able to to com compete in a, in a really competitive markets that are out there. Thank you. And um, I just want to ask you a straightforward question, which I perhaps haven't quite asked yet. Just how broad do apprenticeships go? Okay, Is there so any, I was... anyone who can't take an apprentice? Um, not really anymore. So I think a lot of businesses now probably still uh, think about apprenticeships like they were back in the frameworks and they were very um, traditionally based apprenticeships in lots of areas that have been around for years and years and years. Just got some fun facts for you, really. Um, 
Bring it came on. In two, well, standards came in around 2014, and then we were in a transition, and there was 11 standards. FE put out um, an article yesterday saying we're just about to break the 600 barrier of the amount of apprenticeship standards that are out there. We've wow. doubled in size since 2017 in terms of the amount of standards that are out there for employers to actually That's... look at. And I think that message and actually them being able to access what's out there. I mean, obviously, not every training provider runs all of those standards, but between us, we'll run a vast majority of them. Um, and I think Claire said on the last panel, you know, whichever college or, or training provider is nearest to you, go to them, ask them questions. And if they haven't got that, they can't provide that particular apprenticeship for you. We all work collaborative together in our regions and we will we'll pass on and we'll 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 support and give IAG and pass people on to where they can access that training. Brilliant. Now before I come back to Lisa with the question I promised I was going to ask her, I wonder if I could just use um Lindsay and uh, Rowena a little bit here because I've got some questions from our audience which I think mm -hmm. I need to put to a pro provider. So here we go. This is from Charlotte Ainsworth at Education Business Partnership. As a small business, I, I get this question. As a small business, we would like to recruit an apprentice to plug a skills gap. Is it appropriate to recruit an apprentice to plug a skills gap? Ask Charlotte. Rowena. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got the specialists, um, depending on which sector area it's for, we've got the specialists, so we would support that employer um, to take that learner through that journey. So providing they've got time off the job to actually do the studying and the research and development, um, you know, it doesn't have to be away from the job, it can be in the workplace if it's a small employer, but that individual we can support and develop, no problem. That's perfect. So uh, Charlotte, yes, do not hesitate. If you want to, the idea of using an apprentice to plug a skills gap is in your head, talk to one of our providers because they can help. Um, I've got another question. This is from Laura Brown at Serian. If I can put this one to Lindsay, please. Lindsay, Serian are considering, or they are recruiting a digital marketing apprentice. Is the recruitment process and courts content standard across all providers or are they tailored? Um, everybody will, Apprenticeships can be bespoke. So yes, there's a there's a standard, there's knowledge, skills and behaviour that the apprentice has to be able to demonstrate at end point assessment. So there, there is a, a standard uh, framework for us to work to, but each of us as providers would work with that employer to tailor that apprenticeship to work within their business. So there might be specific additional things that they want in their apprenticeship that that other provider wouldn't, or even a different model of delivery or anything like that. So all providers will work with their employers to table that delivery, but there is a set framework that they will have to demonstrate at the end. So to you, Laura, it's yes and no, I think. So is the recruitment process and course content standard across all providers? There are certain elements which are standard, but the rest is between you, your apprentice, your yes. apprentice and your provider. Is that fair, Lindsay? Yes, that's fair. Great stuff. And I'm going to put the third audience question to you, if I may, Lisa, and it is this. This, this is from, uh, I think it's Philip Rawlinson. At, mm, I can't re read my own writing. Netweave, I think. I think it's Netweave. Apologies to you, Philip, if I've, if I've made that, got that wrong. Apologies if you are actually Philippa, because I really can't read my writing. But I can read the, the, uh, the typed up bits, which says this. What advice would you give to a young person still at school who is wanting to pursue an apprenticeship? What do you say, Lisa? I would say, again, ex as much experience you can in that particular field if you've got an idea of what apprenticeship you want to do. Um, so from the account side, for example, the, we do in, there's internships, um, summer placements, or that work experience while at school. And if you can get something that is relevant, um, you're well on the way. And I think what stands out for me when I get applications for someone who wants to be an apprentice is, what have they done for themselves prior to? Have they done got what work ethic have they done? Have they done paper round, for example, anything? Yeah. Um, it just shows they've got that something about them. Yeah, it, honestly, if, if you, if, I love stuff like that on CVs when we get them, paper round, guides, yeah. whatever it is, it's something that's just slightly to one side that shows interest. Anyway, uh, I can, Philip Rawlingson, apologies to you. I've got it now sent to me by Jessica and it's, it was Net Weaver that question came from. So thank you for that. Very quickly, um, I've got, I'm running out of time. I might go over by a couple of minutes. So apologies for that. Um, Lisa, uh, I did say, I did ask you this question. How do you see apprenticeships operating client businesses? 
Yeah, so I think from looking at it from our point of view, I, I love to share information with um, clients and contacts that we have um, and the real life stories. So we're just sharing something at the moment that shows the different style of apprentices that we've had and what we've got going through. Um, so sharing is one thing. So clients are aware of it in the first place. Um, they're across all different sectors. So I think they cover the traditional elements and um, the construction companies and also the professional side as well. So the legal sector, um, we have a number of them. I think, um, as Rowena said before, it brings new ideas, fresh ideas to the business um, and it allows you to listen to what they think a business should shape. And it, it's the new way, if we think about it, they are the future of our businesses and we should be listening and taking on board what they want and hopefully improve business as we go forward. Boom, we'll have that. Now, final question, <laughs> as, I, as I've done with everybody else, here we go. Um, magic wand time, genie in a bottle, one wish each, that's three in total. So, Rowena Bruff, if you could bring forward an initiative for next year's National Apprenticeships Week, Rowena, Rowena what would it be? Well, last year, I shut my eyes on the genie. I wished for the incentive to be extended, and it was. Sorry about the paperwork, everyone, but we got the extension. <laughs> Employers were very pleased. So this year, I'm going to shut my eyes, and I'm going to wish for... I think we've done a lot of case studies. We've sold apprenticeships. I think we're in a position now, for me, where employees are engaged, apprenticeships are engaged, like school leavers, A-level people, even you know existing members of staff are engaged with apprenticeships. For me, it's about marketing the opportunities. So I want some kind of... Um, social media support for employers to bring their vacancies to life. So that's what I want. So Sean will love that and, one. And, and, I th <laughs> and I think, Rowena, you're about to add to that and also traditional printed magazine media, I think is what you're about I'm, to say. I want to hit the young ones and they are existing, so I want all forms of media, correct, paper, digital, but I want to get these jobs out there and advertise so the employers can recruit. It's crucial. Uh, Gold star, Rowena. Um, Lindsay, what would you do if you had the opportunity to bring something to our um, National Apprenticeship Week next year? Um, I'd like a national competition that kind of gives us a billboard top 100 of the most productive change or initiative introduced by an apprentice that will show um, how impactful apprenticeships can be to businesses. Oh, loving that. Um, well, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to steal that idea wholesale and sell it as my own. It's brilliant. Absolutely. Love it. They're all brilliant, but that one actually just really lit me up. Uh, Lisa Kennedy, the last word to you, um, the last guest word to you. Um, if you had a magic wand, if you were rubbing that genie in that bottle, what would that magic wish be for this time next year? I would like, we've covered off quite a lot of these ideas, <laughs> um, so I've crossed a few out. But I would like apprentices um, to go into schools and educate the younger generation coming through um, on what a difference it makes and that route of apprenticeship and also parents. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we've had some fantastic insight there. It's been brilliant. Rowena, Lindsay, Lisa, thank you to, to you all. It's been, it's been fantastic. That was our Achieve panel. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a panel of achievers. Um, and, and that does conclude our formal business for the day. But I would like you to stay with us if you have the time and the inclination for some of the, the chaos of glorious informal networking on here. Um, uh, what else? Sorry, my, that's my fault. I'd just like you to um, thank you for tuning in and for your many and varied contributions. Thanks for all the questions that came through. I didn't quite get to them all. I got to a, a number of them, but so thank you for all of those. I'd particularly like to thank our panellists for their insight and their expertise. That's Gabriella Hammond, Ian McDonald, Hannah Cutler, Colleen Hickson, Robin Linday, uh, Martin Blunt, Rob Pipe, Claire Shaw, Sean Redfern, Rowena Bruff, Lindsay Monks and Lisa Kennery. I'd um, like to thank all our partners on this event. That's Lancashire Business Views Partners, and they are Blackburn College, Blackpool and the Fylde College, Burnley College, Nelson and Cone College, NLTG, Brackets North Lancs Training Group, Persimmon Homes, Plums, uh, Preston's College, Preston College, beg your pardon, University of Central Lancashire, and Vika. I'd lastly like to say thanks to our friends here at uh, Rob Tank. I've got uh, Rob and Josh and Josh and Rob and I've, and I've got all sorts of people running around making me cups of tea. Um, their televisual expertise has made me look a lot better than I deserve to. Uh, but also thanks to Jessica Hellman and to Abby Leake for gluing this all back together 
at uh, headquarters. The story of this event and some of the insight we've heard will be reported online by the editor, Jed Henderson, probably later today, and it will be available to watch back on demand. So if you think somebody would benefit from the insight in this event, when you get the links, please share them with your contacts. I think we've heard some fantastic stuff today. It's been marvellous. And I just hope this, that today's conversations are not the end. Today's conversations are the start of the next round of conversations. So why not make contact now with your apprenticeships providers, see how they can help your business or your clients' businesses. And when you have been inspired to dedicate more to an apprenticeship program, when you have got an apprentice or you've developed the skills in your business, tell us at Lancashire Business View because we'll have you on one of our panels next time. My name is Richard Slater. I have been Richard Slater and this has been a Lancashire Business View conference. Finally, if you can buy it in Lancashire, buy it in Lancashire. Thank you all. <laughs>